Golden Gate got an off-screen death this time. And is it just me, or does the mangled tower look like two giant praying mantises hugging? Agatha 616. I see the scientists who named Agatha had a sense of humor in the face of apocalypse. Yeah, it's worth a try. Maybe you manifest an Avenger by using 616, or, you know, they were naming it after the 666 variation of the Mark of the Beast. Both good options. Cold-blooded creatures mutated and started eating us to death. Yeah, probably the latter. An asteroid heading straight for Earth. I know, so obvious. Taking one of the classic world-ending events, letting humans actually beat it. And we blew it up, and it was great. And then the way they beat it ends up being their demise. Good stuff, and probably pretty realistic. I'm assuming that was Wall Street Bets doing, but I love that it's just an artist's rendering since they very likely didn't get an actual shot of the ants. Or wait, Mothra? No giant blue fire breathing dinosaur looking monsters to stop it, huh? And Klaus, this is just the craziest mashup of universes. Pretty early on, Julia and I said, you know what would be terrifying giant? Crabs. What makes Kayla's pickles special? And if it's what I think it is, how can anybody be eating special pickles right now when you could be eaten by a giant ant at any time? This is a universe with a unique apocalypse, so they'd be allowed to be inspired by apocalypse media, and looking at their weapons, they are. Although that's just a giant pizza cutter made with a saw blade. Wow, posters for the Warriors and the XX. Good taste, colony mates. Good taste. Giant weapons sticking out of the practice target. Some people play darts, some people play throw the mace. And there are subtle and not so subtle touches of everyone's battle wounds. Missing appendages, face scars. Makes sense, cold-blooded monster shows up in blue. But also brutal GPS tracking. You can even see the blood drips heating up as it takes them away. Auntie was a lie? Is that, is that too deep a cut for my Zoomer friends? Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, Auntie was great. Don't watch that movie unless you're prepared to ball your eyes out. Also, this monster was a guy in a suit. <laughs> Joel's been a monster all along. Well, he's, he's just being cutesy. This has been the best summer of my life. You had to go and say that, Amy. Doomed the whole world with your jinx. I know this is like the nitpickiest of all details, but every review I read got this part wrong. And after Tenet, I just wanted everyone to understand the details. This isn't the asteroid coming to Earth. This is people in the town shooting up flares for help. This could be quite a while after the asteroid, in fact. Joel and Amy's super quick reaction is because they've probably been waiting for this since they've just started hearing news about the giant lizards and insects. Yeah. Good. It's so good to hear your voice. Man, I don't know if this is universal, but anybody who has ever been dumped knew the sound in her voice meant she wasn't feeling it anymore long before the reveal at the end. Found it on the first one. What are the odds? <laughs> Crazy. No, I, I called, I called like 90. Real honesty, which is expectation subversion since lying about nonsense is like a staple of young adult fiction relationships. You know what I, uh, you know what I wish? I could like s snap my fingers and be back in that car with you. Too bad it's, uh... You know, impossible. Oof, another clue. Yeah, that's not the point, Amy. I love you. I love you too. Aw, good thing what you say at 17 is written in stone and immutable. Especially any intentions you profess. I'm gonna come find you. About 85 miles. How long? Seven days. 12 miles a day for Thomas? That boy ran mazes. He could easily do 18 a day. Okay. We're not letting you leave, Joel. You're needed here. Come on, I don't do anything. You fix the radio, you make the minestrone. I mean, fixing the radio is a pretty big deal. And anyone who can make cold soup appetizing. Gazpacho. Oh, I always get those confused. Either way, the kid has a value. Little pathetic, adorable hedgehog. Okay, first, hedgehogs, not pathetic. Actually, that's it. But get it, he's You're fast and small. You're an ass if you get eaten. Encouragement. True, mostly pleasant crabs and pirates. Nope. Also, nope, but I will say this. They thought the world out. The smaller insects that are like, <laughs> dog size, don't attack right away. Just their size changing wouldn't make them overly confident. The giant ones, however, have such little trouble killing humans, and also at that size, you'd need to consume quite a lot of calories so you'd be a little more bold. Yuck, and those are frog eggs. <laughs> Saving a random stupid human. Julia offered to write this one for me, but she said it would just be all about boy because he's the best. Point is, boy is a wife win. Hey, she was a My Hero Academia fan. Is this a dress? Oh, 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 sorry. For real, this simple dress gag with boy being so possessive. Come on with this doggo. So boy's owner knew about the frog and even made a plushie of it. And that might be a painting of him. Did she maybe think it was one of the friendly ones? And even the bugs we'd call giant now have even bigger predators. So silver linings? This movie originally began development in 2012, and so maybe they planned on having it take place in 2014, which would make Arcade Fire's Keep the Car Running from 2007 one of the last hits to be recorded seven years earlier. Hung out on his bus. Man, do we make a great team. 
<laughs> what a good boy. There definitely aren't many rules I know about the Monster Apocalypse, but I know enough to be scared of deep dark water pre-Monster Apocalypse, so this is just confirmation that Joel really is a doofus. Chekhov's poison berries. You know, like the smells. The grass, the trees, the flowers. The monster skeletons, the tanks. Seriously though, the background details in this movie are super fun. Overgrown jets, bikes up in trees. It's a rope, you numbskull! Getting saved by young Gamora and Merle, a survival expert. What more could you ask for? Some kind of noble warrior floating on the wings of love. <laughs> Michael Rooker with the lines. And speaking of background details, giant holes that make my skin crawl, let's pretend like they're asteroid fragment impact sites, but also the dead giant monsters all around. Because I'm not her dad. Uh, my dad got killed along with Elliot. Uh, who's Elliot? My son. You could say he may have been her father, but he wasn't her dad. Daddy? That's not fair. I don't actually know him. He may have been fine. Evidence points to him not being a giant planet god, but who wouldn't want Yandu as your pappy? Honestly, I just like you because you have a really cute dog. Yeah, that sentiment is shared by eh, most everyone watching the movie. <laughs> have I mentioned the sound design in this movie is phenomenal? It's a lot of classic monster sounds, but with new variations thrown in that rattle your bones. <laughs> Mr. Boulder Snail. Thank you, Mr. Boulder Snail. Thankfulness. I was 16 when it hit. See, he was a year younger. The monster attacks didn't happen right away. You get a hot meal or a good night's sleep, not both. I didn't do either. I can't tell you everything, man. Keep up. <laughs> Life lessons in action. Nope. Lesson three, don't take shortcuts. Boy, I already knew that one. Not both. Come on, Joel. Ah. Not both. I'm super tired. And a learning new stuff with your new friends and never sleeping montage is the fastest way to see another nope, nope, nope. The insect looking one's got no peripheral vision. Joel's been a monster all along, you know, because he lacks peripheral vision. Oh, it's just a reminder that he's goofy. The amphibian looking ones like to hide, lure you in, eat your whole. Yeah, that did seem to be the frog's plan. Following every single sound and vibration you make. So it's a graboid? Is this a Tremors prequel? Where the queen sand gobbler just took over and ate everything else to death and then Kevin Bacon saves us? Besides, I think we'd make a good team. I kept waiting for Merle to turn on him and to be honest, I'm here for good guy Merle. Here for it. What if I have uh, terrible instincts? You'll die. <laughs> Especially his honesty. Dogs do love for us to all stay together. Just ask my clawed legs when we're in separate kayaks. We can't break up the pack, Joel. Oh, I'm okay. I'm just gonna... I'm good. <laughs> Generosity. What a good boy. Man, I don't care that it's huge. Is this how normal-sized centipedes or silverfish things act? Never walking on the ground ever again. I love you. I love you. Brutal. But also some irony in being squashed like a bug. By a bug. Anti Stormtrooper aim. <laughs> also, saving such a good boy. We're monster killers. No, that was a different 2020 movie, oddly enough. No, no, not that one. No, not that one either. Nope. Yeah, that one. You guys are supposed to be like the next amazing thing. Such great world building that these robots are just sort of background filler, but then provides one of the more emotionally impactful scenes in the movie. Because I tell her I'm okay. I miss you guys so much. I mean, it would be insane not to shovel piles of praise onto Dylan O'Brien as well as he keeps proving why he's the best thing to come out of Teen Wolf, but you, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I'm alive. I'm good. I'm okay. I, I can't believe you're actually doing this. I mean, really, everything in her voice gives it away. Take notes, people in rocky relationships. Perhaps you will have learned valuable lessons along the way. He does. There are so okay. many ways you could perish. There are, even humans. Sky jellies are beautiful and a fun idea, and you say they're harmless, but why would they become less dangerous now that they can land on your head? I don't think you know what you're talking about, Mavis, with a one. I was bitten in half by something I did not get a chance to name. I'll give you a cool-headedness win for naming it being your concern, though. It's my dog. He's delightful. He is. Thanks. And following along with our theme, nothing good can stay in this world. <laughs> Sometimes you should pay attention to graffiti shadowing. It's crazy that while this scene is super tense and nail-biting, the level of fear we have for them now is much less than earlier. Julia just about got up and walked out during this scene. Also, just a general bravo to creature design. Look at the detail on the teeth. I mean, I mean, don't. It's gross. But also, wowzers. 
And another time, Julia yelled at the movie. So, intended effect? Also, I love that every character has agency in this movie, even Boy. He's not just Joel's dog that he found along the way, he's Boy, whose owner died and he carries this red dress of sentimentality and even makes poor decisions based on it. To the same degree, Clyde and Minnow aren't just a survivor father-daughter duo breaking the mold and never a part of a colony. No, her dad died, his son died, so they left their colony and decided to head for a safer place. Yep. Oh, I feel like Tom Cruise. You can only say that if the grenade and monster were real, I'm not sure I felt unimpeded devotion to realism. Oh. Ha, look at boy still standing by me, I mean Joel. Uh, uh, uh. Appropriate reaction. Dear Amy, it's not looking good. And by it, I don't remember what I was talking about. <laughs> Food to pinch for snakes slugs. Saving Joel's life even after they separated. <laughs> I won't begrudge him his John Hughes moment. Two very different bunkers, but apparently everyone kept their chandeliers, huh? Is that like a thing you're supposed to do when the world ends? I'll keep it in mind. I think it's the most romantic thing anyone's ever done. <laughs> you do? Okay. Compliments? Is that... But listen. Oh. I'm not the same person that I used to be, you know? Last year I lost someone. And he meant a lot to me. But that's about as realistic as it gets. Joel was unlucky that there were no single ladies in his colony, but that doesn't mean the same would be true for Amy and waiting seven years during an apocalypse? Yeah, you could die at any moment. Man, I really miss you guys. And they really aren't coy about this throughout the movie. We're not trying to make you feel bad, Joel. We love you, Joel. Believe in you, Joel. Joel. Love you, buddy. Joel always knew how much he loved his colony, but it took being away from them to realize how important they were to him. Me and my colony were really close, like family. Hey, Clyde was right. Look like this could save someone's life out here. Giant lizard, two stories high. I was the first person to see it coming over the wall. The lizard looking ones can't climb for sh**. What, son of a bitch? Honestly, it's a pretty great pirate plan. You come in all sweet and helpful, do the humble hero act, get people drunk on your homebrew, and then pirate all their stuff. And really, Joel should feel honored he was getting the poison treatment since Cap saw him as a threat. Granted, uh, This is a bad, this is a bad vibe. Eh. Seems all right to me. He's a food stealer. Right You're right. Ha, everybody has been warning Joel about that. You stole food, didn't you? He's a food stealer. Did you steal food? You get caught stealing food? No, I didn't. Why is that such a thing? It gets crazy in the apocalypse. Also, this guy sucks, obviously, but he's not immediately all mustache twirly. This is just what they do. I think I can stop three ass. You get the crap. Eh, fair trade off. Not a huge surprise for those of us who saw Colleen take down Bakudo and Davos and Danny Rand for that matter. Ha, Joel did know his way around the barbecue after all. And I don't blame them for using Jessica Henwick's skills. Boy. Boy solo. Shoot the dog. All right, I'm still not taking back my mustache twirly comment, but giving and obeying that order is how you lose all our sympathy. I'm sorry I yelled at you. <laughs> Sincere apology. Joel's been a monster all along. He's working with the monsters. Oh, he's just having mercy on this one because it itself is a victim and he knew by taking Minnow's advice to- Just look at their eyes. Guess it's time to put the old Joel's a monster theory to rest. Although, I, I don't know, I've yet to meet a nice crab. We're gonna die. We're dying. Clairvoyance. <laughs> and comeuppance. Oh, and then that. Hugging. Seriously, you don't gotta be immediate soulmates to kiss. I'll come find you. You better. Aw, they said the things. I'm gonna come find you. You better. And it's not just, oh, it's fixed, she loves him again. It's real, he came here seven years later expecting them to pick up where they left off and that's bananas. But that doesn't mean they can't build a relationship and that maybe they won't end up together. Good, grounded message. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Baldersnap. And even though he's a seasoned monster killer, sometimes you still gotta run away. More hugging. Snow spiders will probably get him. That's not a good way to go. They will tear him apart. A Love and Monsters series, please. Clyde and Minnow's survival guide. And Joel took the lesson about some monsters being good to heart. He even labels some as friends. Hey, we finally got to see what the Chumbler looks like. It's awful. Love and Monsters is a movie about being stuck inside while scary things rampage outside. I'm the first person to make this connection, feel free to applaud me. No, but actually what's interesting is that when you go back through the deleted scenes, you get the feeling they weren't sure exactly how serious they wanted the film to be, especially the opening. All the post Connor's death stuff is drawn out, letting us really feel the weight of the loss. The idea was clearly to set up that love is all that matters, but it ends up being a bummer. And part of me thinks that may have been a response to real world events. Pivoting to a more lighthearted romp worked exceptionally well, especially with Dylan as your lead. Okay. 
At the same time, the movie does kill someone first thing and sets up that there is death and this world is brutal. It was the best way to establish stakes and genuine fear from, you know, insects that aren't ordinarily scary. Again, see Ante. And when the movie convinces you that the dog is in danger, they've done an excellent job of world building. And ultimately, maybe it's not exactly what we were all expecting from a movie called Love and Monsters. The leads don't officially end up together in the end. But I love it! That's pretty played out as it is, and as we talk about on this channel a lot, there are way more types of love than just romantic love. I mean, even the love between Joel and Amy at the end, the you'll always be a part of me type love. More importantly, Joel loved his new family, but here's the part I love, Joel learned to love himself. It's a coming of age story that's about way more than learning to fight and not freeze or shoot a crossbow under pressure. Joel set off on his journey entirely unsure of himself, feeling useless among his colony mates. And while there's a little bit of the battle-hardened hero returneth in the end, cause that's super fun wish fulfillment, Joel had been carrying the message he needed to learn with him all along. That map that conveyed his value was more than his meritocratic value to his colony. And in the post-apocalypse, where just plain survival is like 90% of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that's a great message. But it took a journey of self-actualization and almost losing it all for Joel to realize what he had and to understand what he already meant to his colony. And Dylan is fantastic. Between him and Hero slash Dodge, the two dogs that played a boy, they make the film. And fun fact, the dog trainer on the film claimed she'd never seen such a strong bond between an actor and a dog as Dylan and Hero, even off camera. And then you throw Michael Rooker on top not to be outshined by his outspoken sidekick Ariana Greenblatt, and you've got astounding talent on screen at all times. As I said, the biggest problem was not enough Clyde and Minnow. But the movie is gorgeous, the monsters are unique and don't overstay their welcome, and even the villain wasn't a one-dimensional goon. I'd watch a sequel for sure, but man, who knows what 2020 and COVID-19 meant for movie sequels. I have no idea. The losses that a film like this took shouldn't be thrown on the movie. Who knows, maybe it makes sense to do a theater re-release right before a sequel comes out. You know, when things are normal again. So that's Love and Monsters. Next week, another disaster -y movie. And since I know only a handful of you saw it, here's a super obvious teaser frame. Until next week. Oh, 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 sorry. Okay, just my backpack. Ah, ah, son. Ah.